Hi, everyone. Welcome to Poet to Poet. I'm Rada Markham, and today I have the absolute pleasure of talking to poet Diane Lockward, author of The Strategic Poet Honing the Craft. Before I introduce you to Diane, I'd like to invite you to become a subscriber of the Poet to Poet newsletter on Substack, if you aren't already. Uh, just go to poettopoet.substack.com and subscribe for free. In it, you'll find interviews like this one, plus helpful ideas on writing and publishing books of poetry. So again, today I am thrilled to introduce you to Diane Lockward. Diane is the editor of The Strategic Poet, Honing the Craft, and three earlier craft books, including The Practicing Poet, Writing Beyond the Basics, uh, the, craft of po the Crafty Poet Two, A Portable Workshop, and The Crafty Poet, A Portable Workshop. She is also the author of four poetry books herself, most recently, The Uneaten Carrots of Atonement, uh, which was published by Wind Publications in 2016. Her awards include the Quentin R. Howard Poetry Prize, a poetry fellowship from the New Jersey State Council on the Arts, and a Woman of Achievement Award. Her poems have been included in such journals as the Harvard Review, Southern Poetry Review, and Prairie Schooner. Her work has also been featured in, on Poetry Daily, Verse Daily, The Writer's Almanac, and Ted Kuzer's American Life in Poetry. She is the founder and publisher of Terrapin Books. Welcome to Poet to Poet, Diane. Hi. So Diane, what inspired you to start creating books on the craft of poetry? You have um, several that we mentioned just now. Um, and then specifically what spurred your latest book, The Strategic Poet Honing the Craft? Well, they've all evolved out of a poetry newsletter that I started probably a dozen or more years ago. Started with about a hundred subscribers and then it grew to over a thousand subscribers. And in that newsletter, I always put a model poem and I do a discussion analysis of the poem, focusing on the elements of craft. And then I create a uh, poetry prompt based on the skills that are in the model poem. So I realized years ago, after a couple of years had gone by, I was accumulating quite a bit of material and I got the idea to put a book together and I uh, broached the subject to my, at the time, publisher and he was game. So I put it together and that became the, the, the original uh, Crafty Poet. And one of my goals then, and it has been my goal for each of the uh, craft poets was to present a book uh, geared towards experienced poets. It seemed to me that there were so many on the market for beginning poets, but really not much out there for poets who are already somewhat knowledgeable about the craft and already uh, practicing it. They had some experience writing poems. So that was my target audience. And I hoped that I was fit, uh, filling a niche market that was sort of wide open. So the first book was a hit. So, and then I kept doing the monthly newsletter and accumulating more material. And so eventually I decided, I think I'll do a second one. So that was The Crafty Poet too. My one regret is I wish I'd given it a different title um, instead of The Crafty Poet too, because the uh, subsequent ones, the practicing poet and the strategic poet, seem to be a little bit more attention grabbing with their uh, more distinctive uh, titles. So anyhow, the second book came about. And at that point, though, um, my publisher had gone out of business. So I was confronted with the, um, a decision. Do I want to spend two or three years looking for a publisher of this book? or do I want to do it myself? Now I would never have been and would not be interested in publishing, self-publishing a book of my own poems, but I felt okay about investigating that possibility for a craft book. So I looked into it and I discovered that there was so much work involved in getting it published that I might as well realize another dream that I'd had for a number of years, which was to start my own small press for poetry books. So that became Terrapin Books. And one of the first books I did uh, was The Crafty Poet Two. 
And then I put out a call for submissions of regular poetry books and it just kept growing and growing. And I thought that that second craft book would be my last craft book, but I kept doing the newsletter each month and I kept accumulating more and more material. And eventually I started thinking, why not do uh, a third book? So I put that together and uh, then same story with the most recent one, the strategic poet. So that's number four in what has become a series of craft books. And one goal has been to make each of those books kind of follow up, jump off of the preceding book so that they work together. You can go from one to the next to the other, but they're also, they stand on their own and you can go from the fourth one back to the first one and not really lose out on anything. So that's sort of how it all came to be. Wonderful, wonderful. Yeah, yeah it sounds like a very organic process. And yet, um, you know, to, to riff on your title, also very strategic, which is a wonderful combination. Um, so what do you hope poets will get out of the book? So you're, you're speaking to primarily poets who have been practicing for perhaps a number of years. Um, you know, tell us a little bit about what those exercises uh, provide. Well, each begins with a model poem by a reasonably well-known poet. And the poems that I choose for the newsletter and subsequently for uh, the book in progress all have something distinctive about the use of craft. I might admire uh, the way the metaphors are used or the way repetition is used or the um, variations with punctuation or it might even be a form that I wasn't familiar with uh, that I'd like to expose my readers to. Or it might be a traditional form like a sonnet, but the poet has done something revolutionary uh, with it. Mm -hmm. So I picked them because they stand out for some reason. And then in the discussion, I talk about a little bit what the poem is about and how the craft elements come into play. And I focus on the distinctive uh, craft po uh, elements in this particular poem. And then, as I said before, I create the prompt, the follow-up prompt based on those craft elements. I want the poet to practice those craft elements. So that's how the prompts uh, come about. And of course, I try to vary them after doing this for quite a few years you have to be careful that you're not repeating yourself, but the world of poetry is very rich, very full. So that really hasn't been a problem. Wonderful. So my, my dog is barking. I'm just, oh. I muted it so, um, but I'm gonna have to edit a bit. So I just wanna pause for a second here. Okay. Or he's not gonna. <laughs> he probably hears he's you. Perfectly, yeah, he's just asleep and can, you know, <laughs> <laughs> totally. <Yeah. laughs> and then as soon as I hit record, something will happen. Um, okay. Well, I think, I think we're all set. So, okay. Right. So, so the practice of poetry revision and honing the craft is a big part of the process of putting together a manuscript and a book of poems and um, as somebody who has a lot of experience in that arena, in addition to sort of this craft side, I'm curious, um, you know, what's your approach to revision? And um, do you have advice on, on, on how to approach that, that important piece of manuscript development? Well, for the craft books, it's really a revision is a huge part of the job. Um, I revise as I'm doing each issue of the newsletter, I do a lot of revision, honing, going back. So it's that the newsletter is coherent and uh, I don't have a lot of spelling mistakes or ungrammatical sentence structures. But when I want to put a book together, I'm bringing together pieces that have been produced over the past three or four years. And so I need to do some coordinating. I need to get some stylistic consistency uh, from one chapter of the book to the next. 
So there's a lot of going through um, honing uh, the pieces that I want to put in the book. And then with the prompts also, I want them to be approximately equal in length. So I might have to add a little bit to one and take away a little bit uh, from another. So that's a huge part of putting together a craft book. The other huge part is organizing. That was huge, especially with the first book, The Crafty Poet. When I had all that material done, I printed it all out, put it in little paper clipped piles and just made a big pile on my kitchen table and just sat there and stared at it for days and days. What am I gonna do with this? What am I gonna do with this? And eventually I began to break down that big pile into smaller piles. And then I stared at those for a very long time and started rearranging them. Now that's not good over there, but maybe it'll work over here. And trying to get the organizational structure of the book, what would be the organizing uh, principles or concepts. And eventually I did come up with, I think, 10 or 12 different sections in that first book and then kind of dealt out the different pieces into those sections and tried to make them cohere. The subsequent books were much easier uh, to organize having done it once. And this most recent book, The Strategic Poet, was really the easiest to organize because early on I had a structural plan already in mind. I knew I was gonna go by craft elements. And so even as I was doing uh, newsletters over the past year or two, I started organizing those newsletters towards the eventual book. I was finally catching on how to do this. So uh, putting together a book of poetry, um, do you go through a similar process where you have little piles of, or maybe a big, big pile of poems, and then maybe they, that gets sorted into smaller piles. I'm curious if there's a, a, a correlation between yes, us. It's, it's really not a dissimilar a um, practice uh, with the poems. You start with your 50 to 60 poems, you put them together, and then you start to think of what's a controlling idea? Why do these poems belong together in a single book? Because you don't want just a bunch of poems, you want a collection of poems. You want a, a, um, them all to be of a piece. Each one has to be part of something larger. Um, otherwise it's, who is it said? Um, I forget who has said that if you have 25 poems in a book, the book itself is the 26th poem. Mm. Everything has to hold together. When I'm reading submissions of manuscripts as a publisher, that's something that I look for. Do these poems belong together or are they just tossed together? So when revising a manuscript of poems, I always would start with the poems and then I would go through them and make notes on what are the motifs in this poem? What are the motifs in that poem? And then I'd start to organize the big pile into smaller piles. I've seen a lot of poets post pictures on Facebook of their process. They go away to a residency or they take a room in their house and they put up a clothesline and start clipping uh, with clothespins, start clipping different groups of poems together. And by the time the residency is finished, they've got an idea and got it put together. But uh, I can tell when I'm reading manuscripts that some poets haven't given too much thought to that. A well-organized manuscript presents itself rather early as being that. And then there are others that have a lot of good poems, but there's really no coherence to the manuscript itself. So anyhow, back to the original question here. The process between putting a uh, craft book together and putting a book of poems together is really somewhat similar. Mm -hmm. That's great, yeah. Yeah, I, um, I so appreciate sort of that, that there's a level, there's a level of, um, I guess I would say it's, it's rather more straightforward 
than a lot of us um, have been led to believe in this, you know, challenge of putting together a book. I think a lot of the the students who who I um, and am in touch with um, feel that there's some mysterious thing that will come about <laughs> in the process. Um, and truly, there is sort of a you know, if not standard process, at least a, a pretty straightforward approach that one can take in order to get to, as you said, something that is coherent and feels all of one piece. Um, yeah. I just really appreciate sort of that, that reinforcement um, of the practicality of that, that process. Yeah, um, you need some organizational skills. It's not the the creative part of the writing, but it's an essential part of putting a book together. And I hear poets say over and over and over again that the thing they can't do is put the manuscript together. I'm no good at organizing the poems. I don't know how to put them together. We'll just sit down and go through and take notes on what are the main ideas in each of the poems. And you'll start to see some common links yeah. among the poems. Yeah. And then you deal them out like a deck of cards. <laughs> <laughs> but in, so, in the third craft book, The Practicing Poet, I have a section, I think it's the second to the last section on manuscript organization, because I felt that there was a need for that. Yeah. 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 It does seem like there's a little bit of a gap in the, the public conversation around poetry in that area. So I really appreciate that that's that's a passion of yours as well. Yeah, the making um, of the poems versus the making of the book. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, so tell us a little bit more about your journey with Terrapin and, um, you know, tell us a little bit about the press. When, when did it start? And what was, the, what was the gap, particular gap in poetry publishing that the press was trying to fill? Okay, I started it in 2015, so it's been going now for seven years, which just seems amazing to me, as I remember so vividly when I first started thinking, oh boy, it'll be so long before I get an accumulation of titles here. Now I have close to 50 titles, uh, wow. three anthologies, and the four craft books, so it's getting fairly substantial. But as I said earlier, I started it because I wanted a place to publish that second craft book since my own publisher had gone out of uh, business. So then I wanted to also do poetry books. Once I decided I wasn't just gonna do that first book, I wanted to actually be a press. I laid awake for a number of nights trying to think of a title for the press. What should I call it? What should I call it? And I came up with a couple names, but it turned out somebody else had come up with them first. So then one night, for some reason, I came up with the name Terrapin. I don't know why, because that's not a word I ever use, but it seemed appropriate. And I was thinking of uh, the tortoise and the hare and the race between them. And the prize goes to the steady. You could be slow, but if you keep on moving forward step by step, you get there. And I felt like that was kind of like what my uh, journey was doing. Also on the cover of my fourth poetry book, I have a big picture of a rabbit. So the rabbit has sort of been one of my uh, personal uh, logos or icons. So anyhow, oh, and I also like the, um, the tortoise shell that each one is different and they all have such beautiful designs. You think a turtle is ugly, but if you look at that shell, they're really pretty exquisite. Um, artistic and a lot of art has been made with the design of uh, the turtle or with the shells themselves. So anyhow, that seemed like a good name. And I asked my husband if he liked, and he doesn't really like um, that sort of thing, but he said, yeah, he did. So I went with that. And then I started um, looking into who should I use for my publishing printing service. So I, uh, decided what I wanted, what would be the most financially reasonable for me to do. And then there are a lot of practical things you have to do. You have to have a checking account. So I went to the bank and opened a, ch a business checking account. 
And um, also I had a policy as I began that what I didn't know, I would ask somebody who did know if they could provide me with the information. So Ami K at Glass Liar Press was very helpful. Jeffrey Levine at Tupelo uh, was very helpful. Uh, who else? Uh, Kelly Russell Agadon at um, to Sylvia's Press was very helpful to me. And I got a lot of the practical stuff from them. Kelly told me what a software program I should use for cover design. I'm still using it seven years later. Um, somehow I found out the hardest thing for me was figuring out how to format a book. But once I discovered the software program that I'm still using, that gave me a good start and somebody gave me a template that I could follow, still using that template, though I've tweaked it um, and individualized it quite a bit. Then I needed to get, and Ami K gave me this information, I needed a state ID, I needed a federal identification number. Fortunately, I was able to get all that stuff online. Years ago, I would have had to have an attorney for it, but I got it all online and rather inexpensively. And then I was ready to uh, do the first, uh, I don't remember if I did the first anthology or if I did the craft book first, but they were around the same time. I decided to do an anthology first rather than open submissions for individual collections. I thought it would be a good one to get a lot of people, a lot of poets involved in, and it would um, give me good experience in putting a project together. So I had this idea to do a collection of poems about dolls. So that became the doll collection. And once I put out the call for submissions, I was just astounded by how many submissions I got, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of them. And I picked, I think about 80, put the book together. I looked at various online sites for, uh, that have photographs and uh, found some doll pictures by a photographer who lived in Italy. I found him on Facebook. He didn't speak much English but I was able to get um, his um, email address and sent him a request for use of his photo. He understood enough that he was able to say yes. And he sent me uh, the 300 res image that I needed. He was thrilled. It was the first time he'd had one of his photos um, as a cover for a book. And he'd gone to an island off of France, I believe. Yeah, it was France. And um, visited a museum of old dolls that this elderly woman uh, had put together. And he took dozens and dozens of these exquisite shots of dolls. So I picked the one that I wanted and that became the cover and the book came about. There was uh, one catastrophe, uh, one of the poets sent me a poem, it was a rather lengthy poem, which she'd left off a critical stanza. And when she got the copy of the book, she was very upset because that stanza was missing. And I said, I published the poem you sent me. She had sent it missing that stanza for some reason, but I redid it. This was early on before I had distributed the book. So I, I, I redid it. And of course that was a lesson to me, always send proof copies. I hadn't done it with that first book. So I always do that now. And you learn something each time. So after I had that book put together, then I figured, well, I'm ready now to put, up, put out my first call for submissions of poetry manuscripts by individual poets. And again, I was shocked because I got quite a few submissions um, from poets who knew what they were doing. Of course, I got a lot and I still do get some from poets who are just sending out for the first time, haven't investigated the press, haven't really done their homework, but they think because uh, they thought back then, because I was brand new, that I would be willing to take just about everything. But I wasn't, and I didn't have to because I got wonderful stuff. One of my early submissions came from the poet Lynn Knight, who's an absolutely fantastic poet and has numerous books out with different publishers and has won all kinds of prizes. Now, at one point, 
she withdrew her manuscript mm -hmm. and I already knew I was going to take it. So I wrote and asked her, why did you do that? And she said, because she was unsure of what kind of a book I was going to put out. So I told her what my intentions were and then she mulled it over and then she resubmitted it and uh, we went forward from there. So she was one of my first four uh, books that I did. And I've now done, I think, 16 different submission periods. Wow. And I usually take like two, two to four submissions, uh, manuscripts each time. Yeah. Wow. I mean, I just want to sort of pause there and say what a tremendous amount of work goes on behind the scenes at a press that I think most poets aren't aware of um, if they've not sort of heard what you just shared with us, which is all of the business end of things that really needs to be in place in order for a publisher to exist as, a, as an entity, um, you know, gathering the submissions, formatting them, making sure, you know, that, that step that you mentioned, um, providing proof copies, right? So that the poet can in, ensure that the work is as it needs to be, uh, just iterating, right? The, the whole process and then there's a beautiful book at the end of that, that long process, but there's a tremendous amount of work that goes on behind the scenes. So um, there is, but it's work I love. So I always say I invented the job that I really wanted. I taught high school English for quite a few years and I loved that also. But after a number of years, I was ready to move on to something else. I was writing poetry at that point and I wanted to, um, spend the years ahead uh, invested in my poetry life. Um, and then this, I never thought at that time that I would end up as a publisher of poetry books, but it just evolved out of that. But it is, it is a lot of work, but it's also work I can schedule as I want to schedule. If I don't want to do any work tomorrow, I really don't have to do any work tomorrow. Mm -hmm. And I don't have to get dressed up wear uncomfortable shoes. Um, I, my vacations are my vacations if I want them to be. So it's great, but it is a commitment. It really is. And after the book is published, after you've published somebody else's book, you really have kind of an obligation to um, PR it a bit mm -hmm. and work to get it into the hands of people, readers. And I like to do that. So I ask my poets to have a website to I make flyers for them, um, press releases, but I ask them to get readings and go out and do them. And uh, I would say it's publishing a book with a small press is a collaborative process. Mm -hmm. You have to work together. Yeah. If a poet doesn't want to work with the publisher, it's not going to work out. The publisher doesn't want to work with the poet, it's not going to work out. So it's a lot of give and take and a lot of back and forth. And I think. One of the benefits of working with a small press publisher is that you get more of a personal uh, relationship than you might with one of the big houses. Right, right, yeah. Yeah, it's it just work and nobody should go into it thinking it's just- Right, easy. right, that the manuscript get, gets accepted, you know, it goes through this process of becoming a tangible book and then that's it, that, that's not the end of story. Um, as you said, it's it's very much that, and that's been my experience. It's very much a partnership, um, yes. between the, the poet and the publisher. And um, I, I think to bring back something you said earlier, you know, having poets having done their homework about what the press um, is about, and understanding understanding a little bit maybe about that partnership aspect going into it, um, it's very important to find the right fit. And I feel fortunate that I've found, um, you know, a publisher for my first book that was so wonderful to work with in that way. Um, but it, yeah. was, it was a lot because I had done that homework to find, again, a small press that was going to work with me and that I could work with um, and feel like I could represent not just myself, but also other poets within that um, that group um, yeah. to be an advocate, you know, it's sort of yeah. like joining a community in a way. Well, you so. said something essentially, or you said you had done your homework to find the right publisher for you. That's essential. Um, too many poets just 
send their manuscripts out willy-nilly without paying any attention to, is this going to be a good fit for me? Do I want my book published by this press? Have you ever looked at a book from that press to make sure that they're doing the kind of work that you would be proud to have uh, representing the, the kind of book that you want to have done? Do they design covers that you admire? Do they put print on the spine? There are some presses now that don't do a printed spine. Mm -hmm. um, if, if that matters to you, it would to me, but it doesn't to some people, then you wouldn't want to submit to that, that, that press. Um, if you don't like the smaller size books that some presses use, then don't submit to a press that uses the smaller size books. If you love French flaps, then Cabin Carey is a great choice. Tupelo is a great choice. But if you hate French flaps for some reason, then maybe you wouldn't want to go there or you'd have to find out first if they do something other than French flaps. So it really makes sense, especially financially these days when it can be so expensive to submit to um, these presses, $25, $30 for a submission. One thing I have prided myself on, I determined early on, was that I was not going to ask an exorbitant submission fee. So I started at $12 and I'm still $12. And, yeah, that's uh, about half, if not less than half. Less than, yeah, less than, most, yeah. Most yeah. are closer to 30, I think at this yes. point. Yes, yeah. yeah. If you're submitting to 10 contests or open reading periods in a year, that's a substantial chunk of money. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, if you're uh, young and young and you have a family, yeah. Expenses. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Um, so what do you what advice do you have for poets who are in the submission process other than doing the homework and identifying presses that they'd like to work with, be in partnership mm -hmm. with? Um, in terms of the manuscript itself, what what sorts of blind spots or mistakes do you see? Um, that the poets could maybe, you know, if not easily fix, um, have some some greater attention attention to to thinking about before they submit. One of the most common tendencies I see, uh, particularly among poets who don't have a lot of experience putting a manuscript together, they have perhaps been very well published in a nice variety of journals and good quality uh, journals, but they don't know how to put a manuscript together. There's such a tendency to wanna to put together all related poems. So if you have six dog poems, you put together all the six poems, whereas it would be much more interesting to find those dog poems scattered throughout the manuscript. So you read a dog poem and then you read a tree poem and down the road somewhere, oh, here's another dog poem, how delightful comes as a nice surprise, but a familiar kind of surprise. So put those chunks of related poems together when you're organizing, but then, so let's say you have five different piles of poems organized by their motif. There's a pile of dog poems. There's a pile of tree poems. I don't know why I'm putting dogs and trees together, how that idea came together. Then you might also have, um, uh, a pile of poems about bodies of water, and you might have a pile of poems about uh, your mother's death. When you get done with those five piles, distribute them into five new piles. So one dog poem here, one dog poem there, and so on, like a deck of cards. And then within each of those newly created sections, start seeing how those poems uh, fit together uh, nicely. So anyhow, that piece of advice is avoid putting clusters of poems together. There's some books where that works, but in most books I find it's better to distribute your motifs throughout the collection. Like I think advice, think of it like a braid with a number of different strands and you are weaving them together into a new pattern. Mm -hmm. Yeah, great. I've also noticed um, folks that I've worked with have have tended to use a chronological strategy at times, or yes. you know, we're, we're so used to a storytelling approach, which can work, but um, 
but yeah, I think. But a poetry collection is usually not a story. That's definitely true what you said. Um, Another very common structural device that I see poets getting because they want to be organized is to go by the seasons. I can't tell you how many manuscripts I've had submitted that are summer, fall, winter, spring, or mm -hmm. some rearrangement of that. It's if I'm getting 10 manuscript submissions, a submission period using that structure, that just tells us it's being way overused. It needs to shake that up a little bit, do something different. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we've been taught to organize in these ways, but um, our default right. habits around organization do us a disservice when we come to organizing poems. So I, I, lo yes. I love this idea of uh, the deck of cards, um, identifying those motifs, uh, weaving them throughout in a, a more natural way because that's how we live our lives, right? We mm -hmm. have one experience and then there's a different sort of experience. And then, so I think that there's a, a case for a sort of more organic structure uh, that follows, follows the human experience a little closer maybe. Yeah, and it's more subtle and it's more interesting to read. You get more surprises cropping up um, for the reader as the reader goes through the man manuscript. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Great. So um, in closing, where can people find you? And of course, we're gonna put your, a link to your book and the press in um, the show notes. And, um, but do you have any other resources that you'd like to point people to in terms of where to find you? Well, I'm on the usual social medias. I'm on um, Facebook, you can find me there as Diane Lockwood. I also have a Terrapin Books page on uh, Facebook. Um, I'm on Twitter, again, as Terrapin Books and as Diane Lockwood. And I have an Instagram account. Um, I've only had that maybe four or five months, so I haven't been horribly active there, but I am there. And then I have this newsletter. I'm not doing it every month as I used to. I'm doing it more sporadically, but it's still there and people can sign up for that, that if they want to at my website, dianelockwood.com. And I guess that's about where I am. Uh, and the Terrapin website, people can learn about the press, terrapinbooks.com. And the guidelines are there. And um, the next submission period will be starting on January 24th and go through the end of February. And then uh, the second submission period of the year is the month of August. Great. Wonderful. So yes, and back. also good for, for folks to know who are um, thinking about submitting in this next year or so. Uh, this is common, right? So one, like just a month of, of um, submissions, right? So the periods are just one month in one part of the year and one month and maybe another part of the year. But some presses, it's just, you know, you've got four weeks and if you're not on top of it, you will miss that window. So don't miss the windows. <laughs> right. Well, some presses will have three, four, five months of an open window. I didn't want to do that. I'd rather have everything coming close together and just get the work done. So I'm open one month for each of those submission periods. So you can't miss that window. And I very often get somebody a day or two after the window closes who says, oh, I was doing this or that. Could you please let me in? Yeah, I always say no. Yeah. yeah, too many, too many submissions already. I'm sure. I'm yeah, right. I didn't need any more. Also, I'm reading along as the submissions are coming in. And it just doesn't seem fair. Everybody else got it in and on, in on time, yeah. and then they don't have to wait that long anyhow. Just five months mm -hmm. till the next window opens. Yeah. Great. Well, Diane, thank you so much. It's been such a pleasure to talk to you. Um, so many bits of advice that. Uh, we all can take to heart and really use, um, very practical. So thank you so much for, for spending time with us today. No, oh, thank you for having me. I enjoyed it.